You are tuned in to your weekly Sunday morning word broadcast, Rhema Power, with Reverend Ni Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor of Powerhouse Ministries International, a program designed to improve your understanding into the Word of God, bring you practical solutions, and empower you to rise above life's daily challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, a weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Today, I want to talk about little but wise. Little but wise. You may be little, but you are wise. As we spoke about some of the dangers in the palace we learned about why god takes you through the palace every patriarch of our faith has been through a place of favor a place of opportunity and a place of power moses joseph daniel abraham david jesus christ himself had to transition through the palace to get to the throne they faced challenges and some of them were set back because they were not prepared for the palace. But the palace encounter was necessary as preparation to get to the throne. You've got to, in your life, be able to understand what brings you into the palace and how to behave when you find yourself in that place so that you do not get destroyed. There are three areas of your life or three key developmental principles for anybody who wants to do well, and I trust that everybody here wants to do well, the first thing in your drive to do well is to lead yourself. Lead yourself. Let your spirit lead you. Love yourself to improve yourself and give yourself a better life. That's what I mean. Set ambitions and pursuits for yourself that will make you better. Decide that I can do better than my current and I want to do better. Every one of you must have an ambition that I want to be better than today. That my future is going to be better than today. That there are going to be better days ahead. There are some things nobody can do for you unless you want it for yourself. And if you don't want it for yourself, you will not be able to get into it. If you don't want improvement for yourself, no matter what anybody gives to you, you will waste it. So the first thing is to ask yourself, do you want a better life or you are satisfied with who you are. Development must start with you seeking a change. I want to get better. I want to live in a better house. I want to be a better person. I want to earn a higher salary. I want to look after my children. I want to be able to do better things than I'm doing today. As long as you feel that way, you will drive yourself against every resistance. You will want to move forward. And so the first thing I want to say to all of you, lead yourself. I want to be more spiritual. I want to draw closer to God. I want to read my Bible more. I want to speak better English. Those are things you must want. I want my business to grow. I want it. I want my ministry to be more impactful. I want to sing better. You must desire those things yourself. If you don't want it, nobody can help you. Anything anybody gives you, if you don't want personal development, you will waste it. So sometimes you are sitting by a pool of opportunities, but you find out that the people don't do well. Not because the opportunities are not there. The same opportunities if it is given to another person you will see a difference. So do you want to do well? Do you want to improve your life? Do you want to improve your spiritual life? Do you want to improve your social life? 
Do you want better relationships? Do you want a better marriage? I want it. So you decide and you lead yourself into it. Number two. The second thing has to do with the concept of sacrifice. It means you sow now to reap later. So I'm going to take something that I have and I'm going to invest it so that I will gain something tomorrow. I'm not interested in eating today. I'm going to deny myself some luxuries now so that I will be a better person tomorrow. It's called sacrifice. I'm going to give blood. It's going to be painful, but it will create a better tomorrow. What are you ready to sacrifice for? What you are not prepared to sacrifice for, you will not gain. You see, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will never cease. There must be a time when something leaves you. There must be a time when sleep leaves you. There must be a time when buying and consumption leaves you. There must be a time when watching TV, it leaves you. There must be a time when spending money on petty things leave you. Why? Because you want to sacrifice for tomorrow. I want a better tomorrow. So anybody who wants to do well, you look at what he gives up. What do you give up? Chatting with friends on social media so that you can study. Leaving some company so that you can read a book. Moving away from some people so you can come for an all night. Waking up early so you can study your word. Because what you sacrifice today, you will gain tomorrow. So you look at somebody's life today, you can tell what he'll be tomorrow by the things he's ready to give up. I'm ready to give up sleep, to wake up and put in two, three more hours into my study, into my rehearsal, into what I have. Because tomorrow, the next year, the next two years, I will have it back. So again, the concept of sacrifice. I want something, so I sacrifice. The third pillar of development has to deal with service. Jesus Christ said, if anybody wants to be great amongst you, let him first be a servant. Service means there's going to be an outlet to use what I have to benefit other people. So if you look at a person who is willingly, freely giving, serving others, you can also tell that the person is giving himself an outlet. All that he has, he's using it to benefit mankind. He serves. Serve the best you can offer with the right attitude and motives. If you don't want to serve, you will never be great. So serve. Every great person is a great servant. So these three things. Number one, lead yourself. Number two, sacrifice. And number three, serve. If you find these three things in the life of any individual, that person will succeed in life. I want to save. Turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24 to 28. Proverbs 30, from verses 24 to 28. It says, There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Little, but wise. The word little means insignificant. The word little means it's small in size. The word little means it's physically weak. When something is little, A baby is little. It's usually weak. Anything can push it away. When you say little, it means you are easily underestimated. Because your background is little. You don't have a good background and a strong background. Your education is little. Your location is little. So it makes people think you are insignificant. When you are little, it means that sometimes you are inferior. Or you can become inferior. So the word little usually is despised. And when you are little, people don't give you recognition. But the Bible says that there are four things which are little upon the earth. So you may not consider them. You may think they are insignificant. You may think they are inferior. You may think they are weak. You may think that they are even detestable. That is why the Bible says that despise not the day of small beginning. Because everything you see that is great was once little. So the challenge is that God may give you little or you have little or you are little to start. Your attitude towards little will determine whether you will freeze yourself and never grow or whether you will use the little to become big. Every time you see a forest, it started with a little seed and over a time, it became a tree. Over a time, it was planted again. Over a period of time, it became a forest. Every time you see 
a head of cattle. It was one. But after a time, it gave birth. And they also gave birth. And they multiplied. And after, it became a large head. Every time you see a business, somebody started, maybe one person, with something little. Every small thing can become a big thing. Depends on you. Your hairdressing salon, your barbering shop, your killiwilly is little. I mean, God took David. David is throwing catapults. How can catapults one day launch you today? But it's something little. When people are holding spears and AK-47, as for you, all you are using is catapult. You see, they laugh at you. They despise it. But something little. Moses had a rod. What is a rod? Anybody can pick a rod by the roadside. But when God came to Moses, he says, give me your rod. What is in your hand? Give it to me. Something little. But everybody wants to see something big. Before, yeah. No, 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 no. If God is going to start with you, he starts with a seed principle. It's little. It's little. So, something little around you. Something insignificant around you. Something that you feel is inferior around you. And somebody you think the person is nothing. Look, everybody was once nothing. Haven't you thought about it? Today you are nice. Today you are beautiful. Today you have brains. Today you can talk. Today you can run and set records. But that's how you started. Something little. Insignificant. Yet you play instruments today. So this verse I'm going to be sharing with you. You see, I want you to begin to see beyond who you are today. Begin to have hope in yourself. That's why I started by sharing those three things. Because once you can lead yourself, once you can sacrifice and you can save, you'll be surprised at what you become. Something little will become something great. One of the worst things you can do is to ever despise yourself because you think you are little. And human beings, I tell you something, they have a way of making you feel little so you never rise up. They can make you feel little because of where you stay and they can think you are nothing because of who you are till you open your mouth. So it is not where you were born. It is what you think about yourself. You think you are little because you see, you yourself have made yourself little and you have frozen yourself in little. But you don't realize that what you do, little. <laughs> there is no indignity in what you do. There's nothing. You see, what you are doing is not the issue. It is what you think about what you are doing. So when somebody comes and says, oh, as for me, I'm a banker. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As for me, I sell this. Then it's like, oh, you are nothing. No, because God will take the foolish things. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. There was a time if you played football, it was like you were little. Till some footballers began to rise up and say no. There were times if you went to school, you became a band boy. You were despised. There were some times if you were an athlete in school, it was like you are useless. But another country picks up those same things. Little things. Say with me, I am wise. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Don't let anybody despise you because of what you do. The way to make sure that you are not despised is to add wisdom. Be wise with what you do. So I'm going to teach you that when you add wisdom to anything you do, you will find out that you become significant. So let's look at the four things. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Verse 26. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rock. You see, I like the word yet. Verse 27. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with their hands and is in king's palaces four things number one the ant the conies the locusts the spider so let's start with the ant when god is taking little things he's telling you there's more to them than their size than their outward there's more to them than their beauty there's more to them than their muscles there's much more to life than the outward so sometimes you find people i'm not nice i'm little I'm disadvantaged because I don't have one hand. But all those things don't matter because what is in you is more important. So I know we are more fashionable than them. (laughs) We have the latest than them, but they focus on the development of their brains and their character, the inward. That's one of the clear differences between an advanced country and a poor country. So this statement about little, look at the Chinese. I mean, how many of us didn't laugh at the Chinese many years ago? 
look at them and describe them in certain terms. But today, the things they invent, the work they do, the places they go. So as you grow in life, remember that it says there are four little things, but they are wise. Say with me, God, give me wisdom. Because when you have wisdom, you will no longer be despised. You will no longer be little. Your size and your outward will no longer matter. And so I'm just going to take a little time and show you a few things about these four people. And I pray that you will catch it. Um, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Kwabna Ansa. I'm the Senior Associate Pastor of Covenant Family Community Church. Also, the Convener, Executive Director of Kingdom Equip Network, and also former General Secretary of the National Association of Charismatic and Christian Churches. I say to the glory of God that Pastor Bernard and his wife, Cynthia, we I call her Mansa, they've been doing such a great job. Recently, I was there in Mamprobi, Tuesday Market, where their church is located, and I just thank the Lord for their lives uh, because it's such a passion for people, especially young people that are trying to find their way back into life. And I was so moved I mean, when they were involved with the food distribution. They really love the people. They have the, a heart for the people. They don't just win souls and uh, make sure that uh, they're establishing the things of Christ, but they, they help them with their education. They help them with their business. They help them with set up jobs and so many things. They are so involved with the people. They really want to bury Christ into the lives of the culture. Community. And theirs is more than just a personality thing. It's a community transformational ministry. And I was so challenged when I saw what God has been using them to do these uh, 25 years or so. I can't thank God enough for all the, the commitment, the passion. And the truth of the matter also is that in spite of all the knowledge and experience and exposure Pastor Bernard and his wife have acquired, there's also still that fundamental belief in and commitment to Christ. They, they just love the Lord. They want everybody to have that personal experience. And it's not so much about the flamboyance. You, I could see from reading from his heart that the worldly goods have very little value to them, but wanting to be a blessing to those that are deprived and those that are lost in Christ is still very central to their lives. And I was so excited to fellowship with them. So I, I just want to thank God for Pastor Bernard, his wife, uh, Cynthia Mansa, and all the church brethren at the Powerhouse uh, Church that you're doing such a great job. I pray for you all that God will continue to bless you and establish you. I pray that God will open new frontiers for you, not only in Tuesday Market, uh, beyond Choco, but there are other parts of the nation and other parts of the world that need this kind of love, this kind of sincerity, this kind of passion for the lost and passion for Christ. And I pray that their dreams will be fulfilled. Whatever they have touched in these 25 years, the Lord will cause it to be fruitful. And what they are yet to touch, I pray that the Lord will cause it to also increase. May it transcend to their generations as they continue this great work. God bless you, my brethren at Powerhouse. God bless you, Pastor Bernard. God bless you, Sister Cynthia. So look at the horse, for example. One of the things about the horse is that God gave the horse the courage. One of the things about horses is that they have great courage. Horses, even if you are firing a gun, you are throwing a spear, you are shooting something, horses will still run against you because they have that courage that nothing stops them. So you find out that in those days when they were doing warfare and guns and swords and things, the horses, they will always ride towards, they are shooting, they are throwing, horses, they have courage against everything that rises against them. They are not afraid. But the ants are not like that. The ants are very small. The ants do not chase big things. The ants are in your backyard, in your kitchen, everywhere. You'll find ants. But the Bible says that, go to the ant and consider her ways and don't be poor. So King Solomon, in his wisdom, after having studied all the animals and giving them names and can quote proverbs about all of them, Look at what he says about the ants. He says that the ants are small, yet they have wisdom. What does he say about the ants? The ants are a people not strong. He says these guys, they are not strong. They don't have muscles. They are not physically imposing. They don't terrorize anybody. Yet, their wisdom keeps them alive. Mm. Yet, their wisdom. Number one, the ants are not strong. 
but they will never go hungry. So the fact that you are little, you are not strong, doesn't mean you should die of poverty. You see, that's not wisdom. The fact that people detest you, the fact that you don't have what other people have, doesn't mean you should allow yourself to become insignificant. When you see ants, they are marching usually in two different directions. One ant are going one way, and the other ants are coming the other way. They are moving together, and they are carrying pieces of leftover food, or little bones of fish, and other items during summer. So that when winter or the rainy season comes, the ants can go and hide somewhere and be safe, and make sure that they don't die, but they still have enough food to eat. The question I ask myself is, who tells the ant that it's about to rain? The ants don't have a meteorological service. The ants don't have a weather forecaster. Yet the ants have been able to observe nature and guide themselves. And they say that we are not strong like the horse. We are not strong like the eagle. As for us, we are weak, oh, but we've got to behave ourselves. And so the ants begin to learn how to determine times and seasons. And because they are not strong, you find out that they move together and they prepare for winter. So what is one of the lessons from the ant? Preparation for your future. You see, in this world, if you are little, you are going to compete against other people who are bigger and better and more significant than you. Prepare for your future so that you don't let those people come and wipe you off. Can you think of your tomorrow? For example, as a child of God, do you think about your tomorrow in Christ? Do you think about heaven? You come to church. What do you do to prepare? The Bible says the summer is over and the harvest is over. And yet there are many people who are not saved. Do you, do you consider when little by little you come to church, it's a little. You pray, it's a little. It seems like it's nothing. You go and you come every day. You don't realize that in actual fact what you are doing is preparing for your tomorrow. You can't determine the times and the seasons. That today you are now growing up. You are now getting to ministry. You are now a cell leader. You don't prepare that tomorrow, Charlie. I've got to learn how to pray. I've got to prepare myself for marriage. I've got to prepare myself for ministry. And you are still not doing anything. But the ant, look, I mean, sometimes you and I see ants on the floor. And we can wipe out a whole race of ants. Yet they don't give up. So the ant will face difficulties. The ant, somebody will step on the ant. But still the ants don't give up because there's a bad experience. Ants are very resilient. Eh, the way they spoke to me, eh, somebody, somebody stepped on my toes. Ants can be wiped out like this. I mean, we can do this and immediately wipe out a whole generation of ants. And yet, ants don't give up. So you find one of the things about ants is their resilience. They don't give up. They don't give up. Ants count their eggs. And they arrange them in order of age. As they've marched to find food, they leave tracks for their friends to trace to find the food source and back. So when you find an ant, and an ant is going in that direction, as the ant is walking, or as the ants are walking, they leave a path so that other ants who are coming can follow. You see, I want to ask you, do you leave a path where other people can be Christians? Do you leave a path where other people can learn how to pray, how to study the word? Or you, when you come, then you will remove the path. So the same path you have walked on to become who you are, You've cleared it. In Ghana, some people call it the pull him down spirit. They alone want to succeed. They don't want to show anybody how they did it. So you alone, you pray. You don't have anybody you are bringing along. You alone, you come for church service, but you don't bring anybody along. You are not creating a path for other people to walk on. You don't realize that as you move on to search water, your brothers are also following you and they must also find the water because you've left a track. So instrumentally, I don't want to teach anybody. That's for me, it's just me. Ashes, eh, when somebody comes, let me push him away. Ants don't behave like that. Ants leave a path for other people. Because they said, ah, if I die or somebody wipes me, my other brothers might still find the water. If in my going for it, somebody just comes and takes me off the path, the other people must be able to walk on the path I've left and still go to the water. Ants think about one another. And so look at what the Bible says. You know, sometimes you may find people who have been in church for long. They don't want another person to become like them. So, I'm going to be the only singer. I'm going to be the only teacher. No. Ants create a path. Ants create a path. The ants, they are not strong, but they create a path. So, they pass on a generational blessing. They are four little things. Yet, they are wise. If you like, go home today. Try an example. Put some fish somewhere. 
and just leave the ants. And wipe out the ants and leave the fish there. You find another group passing somewhere else with the same fish. Because we must get the fish. Because we must prepare for our future. You know, many of you come to church. You don't realize that you must follow a path that has been created for you. Somebody has created a path for you. Walk in it. Somebody has told you what to do. Do it. Somebody has left the path and said, go for cell meeting. Come for prayer meeting. Come early to church. The path has been created. Somebody comes early so that you can follow and have benefits. Somebody is a teacher so that you can learn what he has already learned. A path has been created for you. You can't create a path for yourself, but you follow. Why? Because you are exceedingly wise. You are exceedingly wise. If you destroy their path, they will know that there's a breach and create another one. They can't carry food that outweighs them. They carry dead cockroaches. They carry spiders. They carry flies. They work together and love themselves for their bigger vision. Those are ants. The wisdom of the ants. The second thing in verse 26. It says the conies are but a feeble folk. Yet they make their houses in the rocks. The conies, some people call them rabbits. But they are not rabbits. They are actually some mountain animals. They look like rabbits. They are found in heights of 4,200 meters above sea level. They live in the rocks. They are very weak. They have nails instead of claws. And they have weak teeth. They don't have any means of self-defense. And their name means hider. The word "coni" comes from a word which means hide. They hide themselves. So because they are very vulnerable to attacks, they live in the rocks. And they create holes in the rocks. And they have a guard or a sentry. So anytime there's some bird or some animal that wants to pick them, because they have easy prey for hawks and eagles and even for other animals, they know they are weak, they are feeble. So what they do is that quickly, they don't expose themselves, they go into the rocks. When they come out, they may just come and peep and look around, then quickly snatch food, go back into the rock. So they are safe. So even though they are very weak and very vulnerable, they've learned that, Charlie, as far as the rocks are shelter. I'm sure all of you have heard this term. Jesus is the rock. Blessed be the name of the rock. Our God is a rock and a shelter. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Where did we get from the example of the conies? When you are a child of God, you've got to realize that uh, uh, I'm fighting against some enemies that actually, if I lose God, they'll chew me. So you behave like a coney. You search, you watch, you make sure you are always in the rock. You are always in Jesus Christ. You don't expose yourself to the world and walk around as if you dear, you are nothing and allow some animal to pick you up. And many of us are exposing ourselves to things that easily allow us to be picked up. You go places that you are not supposed to go. And then you have problems and then you are wondering because you left the rock. Especially for people who are just born again. You think that, oh, after all, what is it? You see, arguments don't save you. The badger or the rock can say, me, I'm like this, I'm like this. Me too, I have the same right. I have the same privilege. I can go anywhere. After all, what is wrong? But if you expose yourself and you are a pony, some animal will just pick you up because you are defenseless and you are meat. That's why we say there are places you don't go when you are born again. There are things you don't do when you are born again. Because you expose yourself. They are very difficult to capture. And always have a sentry on guard to sound alarm. And they quickly scurry into holes. You've got to realize that they are feeble, but they are wise. They are feeble, but they are wise. It means they are weak. Anybody can talk to them and beat them, but they don't expose themselves for people to talk to them anyhow. You see, if you are a certain type of person who is coming from a certain background, listen, there are sometimes you don't expose yourself for people to abuse you and talk to you anyhow, learn to do the right thing and gain respect. Eh, Bonakemi, you are here. What did you do? Hide in the rock. Don't expose yourself. You know where you have come from. You know how difficult it was to get a job. Be wise. Be wise. Don't expose yourself to be sad. Don't expose yourself to be laid off. Don't expose yourself to go back to the bush. Don't do things that will send you backward and expose you and destroy you. Because you know that, Charlie, you are vulnerable. You know you are weak. And one of the worst things is to find somebody who comes from a certain background. You are poor. Your parents are feeble. Your household is feeble and weak and everything around you. And then somebody gives you a job. And then you expose yourself. You may be little, but be wise. You may be little. You may not have claws to fight, but be wise. Don't expose yourself. Don't expose yourself. We'll continue next week. Put your hands together for the Lord. Hello, precious one. 
we wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Manor, a weekday Bible teaching service which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek his faith for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the word of God in Jesus' name. God richly bless you. Thank you for listening to Rhema Power with Reverend Me Bernard Adiakwa. We hope you've been blessed. For further information, contact 0303-931-841. Tune in next week for another insightful teaching on Rhema Power. Thank you.